we're going to get started here. I want to welcome everybody. My name is Ivan Booth, and I'm the DrupalCon front end track chair. Um, I'm a freelance developer at rootwork.org, and I'm thrilled today to introduce Jonathan Snook. Jonathan is most well known for his book, S Scalable and Modular Architecture for CSS. And if you're not sure what that's about, you're going to get to learn all about it in just a few minutes. While not technically a lumberjack himself, he's been smacking CSS under control for some years now. He's written for A List Apart, 24 Ways, and .NET Magazine, and also wrote two other books, The Art and Science of CSS and Accelerated DOM Scripting. And he's actually speaking at both DrupalCon and Web Visions here in Portland this week, so he's a busy guy. Jonathan has been building websites for nearly 20 years and currently works at Shopify. He previously worked at Yahoo, where his redesign of Yahoo Mail was the raw source of much of the Smacks approach. I'm really happy to be welcoming Jonathan to DrupalCon because Drupal 8 itself is adopting a Smacks approach for its style sheets. So while his ideas are ap applicable to any web project, I'm particularly excited to see the positive effect that it's hav having on Drupal front-end development. And while you can't get Jonathan Snook's face on a t-shirt, you can get Jack the Lumberjack. I know you can't see it in the back, but there he is. Uh, you can get Jack the Lumberjack on a t-shirt along with the book itself at smacss.com. So with that, please welcome Jonathan Snook. So thank you very much for uh, having me. Uh, that was a great intro. I like that. Um, so I'm here to talk about how your CSS is a mess, and uh, to be honest, uh, mine was too, and still is from time to time. So I came across this tweet a while back, and uh, I think it's uh, rather uh, amusing. So observing that the maximum number of people who can productively, simultaneously work on CSS is one. How many of you agree? That's a pretty good crowd. And the thing is, is like, you know, before Shopify, before Yahoo, um, I ran my own company called Sync.ca, and the thing with that is that it was only one person. That means that I was the one who had to do all the front end, all the back end, everything that I needed to do, deliver it off to the client, and then move on to the next project. That could have been the absolute best CSS or the absolute worst, and the thing is, is that I wouldn't have known it because I just pass it off to the client. I never have to worry about it ever again. So. As mentioned, right now I work at, for a company called Shopify, and at Shopify, we're a team of uh, like four designers, and we work with five developers, but we're still only one team working on one project. That means we're all in the same room, and anytime I have a question, uh, anytime I'm like, okay, I have to work on this file, can you just like not commit that? I've got some changes I need to go in, I don't want to deal with any merge conflicts. I can turn around and talk to people. But in between these two, uh, I work for a company called Yahoo. Uh, you guys might have heard of it. It's been in the news as of late. Um, and I, I worked with a team of 30 designers. Um, these guys were um, Photoshop, uh, Kings and Queens. These, they, they knew Photoshop inside and out. And they would pass their work on to us, um, the prototyping team, which is the one that I worked on. Now, the thing is, is that we did prototyping a little bit different. Um, I, I had this, like, brilliant idea that what if the prototypes we built were actually, like, production quality? And so we actually took the front-end code, all the HTML and CSS that we would do to build these prototypes, and passed them off to a team of 200 engineers. That the stuff that we were producing uh, ended up being integrated with multiple teams and multiple projects. So we were dealing with Yahoo Mail, Messenger, Calendar. All of this stuff was based off the same HTML and CSS. Because traditionally the way they did it was actually take a Photoshop comp, throw it over to the engineering team, and then six months later the team would go, here's the product. And the designers would go, that wasn't quite what I wanted. And when you're dealing with multiple teams, different teams have different ways of solving problems. And we really wanted to solve the problem once and distribute that. Uh, really early on in the project, for example, uh, we wanted to do this little autocomplete widget. So our team built the HTML and CSS and actually built the JavaScript prototype for this autocomplete widget. Passed it off to the different teams like, hey, look, we've got this autocomplete widget. And, and sure enough, the messenger team went away and 
they built all their own JavaScript stuff for it, and the mail team went off and built all their JavaScript for it, and we kind of went, hey, guys, we've, we've already solved this problem. Let's just use all the same code. And this, this is something that happens with large teams working within their own silos. We really wanted to try to consolidate this. Now, when it comes to CSS, I think that there's this conception or misconception that CSS is easy. I know on a lot of projects that I've done where, you know, with the back end development, all the PHP code, got to be code reviewed, you know, got to do that before it goes in. JavaScript, of course, got to do a code review. CSS, oh, it's just CSS, go ahead and commit it. Don't worry about it. And the thing is, it's like, okay, we take this site that's just like plain HTML, we throw in some styles, and just magically we have a site. You know, we have selectors, we have properties, and then suddenly we get CSS that kind of looks like this. This is copied and pasted from an actual project. And, and this is really just an abstraction away from inline styles, because we know inline styles are bad, right? And, you know, this makes me kind of go like this. It's a little scary. Uh, here's some code that I took from, from uh, MySpace. Uh, you know, we have these, like, these really long selector chains, and if you can imagine the HTML that must exist for this to work, right? We have to have all these elements in place. They have to have all these classes on it, all these IDs. Everything has to be very meticulous or it's not going to work. And the thing is, is that the only thing that we really care about is the stuff at the end, right? We care about the status bar. We care about, like, the status thing. You can see there's probably a link in there and there's a separator. That's really all we care about. Um, now, Drupal doesn't get off the hook. This, this side I took from, from the Drupal.org website. And the interesting thing here, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of shortening it here, but there's two things here. There's a header nav and there's a content nav. And they both do the same thing. It's, it's a horizontal navigation. But instead of, you know, codifying this pattern and reusing the same code, they duplicated exactly the same code for, for both things. Um, and it's, it's this idea of reuse that we want to, to take advantage of. Um, now, I, I'm certainly not without blame. This is from my own website from uh, a few years ago. Um, the thing is, my website hasn't changed in like four years. So I, I don't have to worry about it. The code can be, like I said, as good or as bad. And because I'm the only one touching it, and I haven't touched it really in four years, it's fantastic. This is great code. But really, this is what I cared about, right? I cared about what the author name looked like, and I cared about what the comment number looked like. Now, of course, we often run into projects where, uh, you know, we have a single CSS file, and we just keep adding to it each new page that we work on. Uh, we add some more stuff, and, uh, you know, you're working on, uh, you know, I just need to fix this really quickly. I'm just going to add it to the end of the CSS file. And, again, this is from an actual project. And the thing is, is when we have CSS that is this big, right, we end up fiddling with it, constantly trying to change things, add a new selector, um, just, we're going to throw a bang important on it. We're going to get something that will finally work uh, until, you know what, maybe we just kind of get frustrated um, and get rid of it. Then again, maybe some of you feel like this is, you know, you're really happy. I mean, CSS is fantastic. <laughs> okay, so, you know, I mentioned working at Yahoo and a lot of the, the stuff that we were doing. Um, I started really thinking about the, um, the process that I was working on, and I wanted to find something that was scalable, you know, for, for what we were working on, and, and realizing that taking a modular approach, taking things into these little components, um, and deciding on this architecture for CSS, um, and of course everybody loves acronyms, so I called it SMACS, uh, S-M-A-C-S-S. And so the idea with this was, like, really trying to understand how do I build a website, how do I write my HTML, how do I write my CSS so that it makes sense. Now, there's a bunch of stuff in the book. Um, I'm only going to talk about um, three things today. One is categorization. You know, how do we, what, what are the rules that we're writing, what are the purposes that they're serving within our design? Once we sort of categorize things, what is the naming convention that we want to use to help clarify the intent of what we're writing? And lastly, and this is going to sound a little weird, um, decoupling HTML from CSS. Uh, this idea that, you know, yes, CSS is designed to style HTML, um, but bear with me, we'll get to that. Okay, first thing, categorization. 
So in thinking about things, I realized that there was really sort of five categories that things kind of fit into. Uh, one are phase styles, uh, layout styles, module styles, uh, state, and uh, theme. Um, just bear with me a little bit because I realized that you know modules are kind of one of those things that you guys have a, a problem with. Um, as far as naming convention, modules are a little confusing. So apologies that I, I wasn't as aware of that naming convention when I wrote the book. Um, I, it's been explained to me that like regions and kind of like how you deal with templates um, is more the, the, the sense of things as opposed to using the word module. Um, and then, you know, of course we have states. And then themes I know have a specific meaning within within Drupal. And again, this is really just kind of talking about user-defined customizations. Um, and again, I'll kind of get into that. Uh, so just think about that. When I say module or when I say theme, I'm not talking about Drupal modules uh, or Drupal themes, um, but really just sort of these other concepts which I'll get into. So base styles are like, what, are, what does the HTML element look like? No classes, no IDs. It's just what does that element look like by default? So if you're using a CSS reset, such as like Eric Meyer's uh, reset or um, something like normalization, uh, normalize.css. Uh, those things are really defining what that baseline is for everything on the page. Those are your base styles. And then on top of that is, are your layout styles. So layout styles is, you know, you have a page and there's a lot of stuff in that page. What constitutes layout? To me, those are like one of the major containers, like you've got a header, you've got a sidebar, you've got a content area. And then you want to put content in here. This is just that structure that you have on the page. If we look at something like the PayPal website, you know, it's, it's, it's got a header. It's got this sort of main content area. It's got a little sidebar stuff. Um, you might have a grid system that you're using with on your particular site, something like 960GS. And again, it's just like, okay, here are these buckets of places on my page that I want to put content in. I'm not worried about the content that's actually going in there just yet. I just want to know about the structure. And Amazon, very much the same way. We've got a header, we've got a content area, we've got the sidebar. Uh, you know, we might have a little grid system on the side here. So now that we have that, we want to take these these content pieces, um, and again, I call them modules, part of the naming convention. And we want to dump these pieces in. So we might have like tabs, we might have a customized list, we might have buttons. Um, on the PayPal site, for example, we have the um, inputs, um, very similar look and feel. You know, they got a rounded corner, they've got a little button, um, the gray background, all of these things, this is this visual design pattern that we want to repeat in a bunch of different places. Um, we have our buttons. In this case, there was gray buttons, there were blue buttons, you know, maybe throughout the site there are, are different types of buttons doing different things. Uh, but even these like little content pieces on the side here, um, where it's this repeating piece that is, is used over and over again. On Amazon, you know, where we have on the sidebar, um, this little thing with the image on the left, text on the right, um, all those different styles required to, to put that together, this piece is the module. And this is the, de the design that we want to reuse. And likewise here, you know, it's a different style. In this case, we've got the image on the top, uh, different pieces of content that we're including, but it's a different visual style um, that we want to represent. So now that we have something, and we have the sort of this visual style that is being represented for this particular module, we sometimes have variations on those styles that we want to uh, demonstrate. So I, you know, I mentioned with the PayPal site where they've got gray buttons and blue buttons. Um, on Yahoo Mail, we had search buttons, large buttons, small buttons, dark buttons. Uh, we had a lot of buttons. And each of these variations was a sub-module. Now the thing is, is that sometimes it can be a little bit hard to recognize these differentiations. So for example, um, on Shopify, we were building uh, the website. We have these little drop-downs. I got a little pointer here, you can see that. Uh, drop-down that we had, click on a button, we've got this drop-down, it's got a little drop shadow, a uh, little rounded corners, it's got blue links, white background. And the thing is, is that when we were building this autocomplete widget, uh, the designer originally putting this together was like, you know what, this is a search component, right? Like I've got my uh, search input box and I've got my search drop-down and I'm going to style all of these using the, the classes to put this piece together. But you'll notice here, it's, it's in, in thinking that way, it's thinking about the, the context that all this stuff is existing in, and it doesn't actually lead to reuse. 
when we look at this drop down, it is actually quite similar to what we had before. It's got the drop shadow, it's got the blue links. The only thing is, is that we've augmented it with a couple other things, such as the little icon next to it and a little footer at the bottom. But other than that, it was actually essentially the same thing. So there was a lot of reuse in this, and it's about recognizing those visual patterns that we're trying to codify. Now, in the context of sort of modules and submodules, I, I refer to sort of like this root element that we have in the node. This we're going to apply a class to a node um, in our HTML. But a lot of modules have other components that are part of them. Uh, and I refer to these components as subcomponents. Um, so for example, you might have a modal dialog um, where we've got a header, we've got a body, and we've got a footer. And if we were to look at the HTML for this, um, you can start to see some of the naming convention um, that I'll be talking about in a little bit. But we can see we've got a modal, and we've got a modal large here, so that's the, um, the module and the submodule name. But we have these other pieces, such as the header, the body, and the footer. And inside those, we have other content. And the naming convention is indicating here that they're, they're belonging to something else. Um, so you may have modules inside of modules, um, and these, these subcomponents are part of a particular module. And again, talking about naming conventions, that these things are, are related, and that's the thing that we want to really clarify here. So we have modules and we have submodules. Um, we also have things called states, um, and states for me are representing JavaScript interaction. That when you have JavaScript coming in and applying a state to a particular object, um, that we want a way of representing that. And so, for example, we might have a default state, and then we might have an active state. That when I click on it, what happens when I do that? Um, I might have a default state and then a disabled state. Um, these states that I can add or remove from a particular item. Okay, so we've covered four things so far. Base, layout, module, state. Uh, last one is theme. Now, theming, I think, is a little bit of a confusing topic. Um, I know since I've uh, written the book, a lot of people have sort of talked to me about, like, when do you actually apply theming? Because for me, theming is not something that is necessary on a lot of projects. In fact, in the first draft, I really said there was only four, and this one was kind of like this throw-in topic. Most websites don't have these requirements. Um, and what are those requirements that I'm referring to? So in this case, you know, we've got this Yahoo uh, mail theme that is purple. Yahoo loves purple. Um, but not everybody loves purple. Maybe you get stressed out by purple and get stressed out by mail. And you know what? You want something a little bit more relaxing. You want grass, blue sky, just relax. And it's th this ability for the user to come in and customize things that we want to uh, isolate those styles for that. And the reason is, is because if you can imagine the user coming in and like, okay, I want to preview what my theme looks like, do you want to have to take all of your CSS and send it down the pipe again, or would you rather just send the parts that are changing? And in this case, we just wanted to send the parts that were changing. We were, we were able to um, actually change the theme using six colors and a background image. And that actually allowed us to create a, a ton of themes really quickly, um, but it also, from a CSS perspective, allowed us to isolate those styles really easily. Um, and that was great. Uh, you know, we also have other things like language, where, you know, typography might need to be bigger. Um, and, and it's these user-selected, you know, user configurations that we are trying to isolate, and that's what I refer to as theming. And again, not every project has that. Most of the projects I've worked on don't have that kind of thing, and I would not actually need to use theming on a particular site. So with all this categorization, um, you know, what does this really mean? You know, it's, it's about having your CSS and your HTML do one thing and one thing only. A gentleman by the name of Harry Roberts um, had written an article. You can check it out at snk.ms slash 1r. If you're wondering what the snk.ms stands for, it stands for Snookums. Thank you. Um, but th this article is interesting in that he, he takes this concept and applies it to CSS. And in that, what, like what you're writing, that the HTML, this node that you have on your page, is serving a single purpose. And the CSS that you're writing also serves a single purpose. Because you know what happens is that once we, we create, all, create all these dependencies, things become very brittle. Again, I, I'm sure a lot of you have experience with this, coming into a project weeks, months later, and then it's like, can you just like update this one little thing? 
oh yeah, sure, you know, you find out the class and the selector that you need to, to change, you go into your CSS, you make your modification, and then suddenly four other things break. Crap, I didn't want that. And of course we do all these other things, and then instead what do we do? We just like, okay, I'm gonna just throw a bang import under this one little case or something to get around that. And really it, so like here's an example, you know, you have, um, you can imagine a grid system where you've got your, um, grid class being applied to the outside, you've got these columns, and you have this module. Maybe this is a playlist. And in this case, what I, I mean, from a CSS perspective, you can kind of see something like this that might happen where I've got grids, I've got uh, my column classes, and then I've got my module classes separate. The thing is, the moment we start combining these onto a single element, we start creating these situations where styles can clash. And then we have this fight that we have to figure out who wins in this particular case when I have these two things. And then we start adding, you know, well, in this case, um, maybe when I have a module class and a call class together, I'll do dot call dot module, and I'll add that CSS there to override the other ones. And it's these types of things that we want to avoid. And this is a really simple problem to solve. We just create a new element that will be our module. Now here's a, a less subtle one, uh, or a more subtle one, yeah, more subtle where we have a grid, um, but in this case, I don't have a column class. So it looks like, okay, I'm just gonna apply the module class to this list item, and this makes sense to me. But the thing is, is that list item is still serving a particular purpose in the context of this unordered list. If we look at the CSS, very similar to what we had before, where the list item is serving the purpose of that column. And again, in this case, separate it out. And for anybody, you know, doing backend development, like Drupal, you know, it's it's easier when we can isolate things. Uh, so if we have a grid system that I can create this grid system that I can reuse over and over again, no matter the context, the other thing is, is that I can test this. I no longer have to load the entire website, go through every single page to make sure that nothing is broken. I can take a look at just this HTML structure and just the CSS for this. I don't have to load in any of my module CSS or anything else. I just have to load in my grid CSS to see how that renders. Now, the other thing is, is that with the list item, you know, if we look at this kind of thing where I've got a class on a list item, I can't test that list item by myself because the list item needs to be part of an unordered list or an ordered list. It, the LI itself as an HTML element just isn't really designed to stand alone. So as a result of that, you know, having modules and the root of a module be an element that can exist. And so for me, it's like, it's gonna be a div, or maybe it's a section, or maybe it's an article, whatever HTML element that you're using, that it represents this root node that encapsulates that module into itself. Because the idea behind categorization is that it's about isolation. And by isolating these things, it allows us to reuse these components in different contexts without having to worry about the context that it's in. Okay, so we've covered that topic. Um, naming convention. So with naming convention, you know, we're talking about clarifying our intent because usually when we write CSS, you know, we create these long selector chains, we're, we're worried about what does this HTML element look like on my page? And it's this idea of thinking about the page that um, can cause some havoc. Okay, so I'm gonna touch on one topic before anything else, before I get into naming convention too deeply, is the idea of using classes over IDs. Now, if you remember way back to that Drupal slide, using the ID, like pound nav head, pound nav content. The reason why I try to avoid this um, is if we kind of look at our specificity chart where we have, you know, uh, these sort of four classes. This is where specificity, you know, when I create a, a, a CSS selector, um, what wins? At the one end, I have element selectors. At the other end, I have inline. And in between, I have class and ID. Well, element selectors, of themselves aren't gonna give us a whole lot of what we want. Um, you know, they're, they're great at setting the base, but we need something a little bit more useful. You know, if we need something to, to reuse components over and over again, um, we're gonna need something more than just an element selector. But on the other end, of course, we want to avoid inline styles uh, because it's just not very maintainable. So we're left with class and ID. And the thing is, is the moment you add an ID selector, the only way that we can override that is either by throwing important on it or um, having an ID 
selector with the other ID selector with the class selector. We start having to add more selectors in order to get it to win. So we're going to take a look at a really quick example of that. So we have a link. Um, we've got subdued links. And in this case, if you can imagine um, uh, a form. And on this form, we want to cancel link. And you think, you know what? I'm only going to have one cancel link on a page. So it's going to be an ID. This is what I want to use. So my links are blue. Uh, my subdued links are gray. I want them to kind of fade into the text. And then my cancel links are red. I really want to draw attention to these. So again, looking at the HTML for this, we have our links. We've got our subdued links. We've got our cancel links. Um, but the client comes back and says, you know what? This one particular cancel link, I want it to be subdued. But specificity says this is not going to work. Now, I'm sure on a Monday you might want to take the time to figure this out. Um, but yeah, on Friday we're just going to bang import and all the things. And you know what? That, that works, right? I'm done. I'm going home. I'm but, uh, you know, this little specificity buster, we, we want to kind of avoid that. So what other ways could we have solved this problem? Well, I could have doubled up my selectors. Again, this would have worked. Pound cancel, dot subdued. But of course, all these other edge cases, I start adding more and more examples. My CSS gets bigger and bigger. And this is really easy to solve. We just make the cancel a class. And as a result of this, we just apply that class to the element. And our CSS is simple. It's understated, very straightforward. We can understand what's going on. Our HTML may still have an ID in there. That's absolutely okay. Our JavaScript may require that ID to be there. That's absolutely okay. But from a CSS perspective, all we care about is, you know, what is this thing supposed to look like? And this is where I feel that classes are best suited. Okay, so now that we know that we want to stick with classes, what kind of naming convention do we want to use? Um, so for me, a module name uh, doesn't have any hyphenation. Um, th this represents the root node of this module. So what does this thing look like by default? So I might have a button. And then those sub-modules, um, I separate with hyphen. So button large, button small, uh, default search. So all these different buttons that we have. Now, a common question that I often get asked here is, is like, why are you prefixing everything when you could just do like dot .btn dot .large? That would work just fine. Um, the thing is, is that have you ever run into a project where you're like, OK, you know, I need you to find every single large button on the site. So you do a search for large. OK, perfect. Uh, but not only did you find any large buttons, but you also found large inputs. You found large modal dialogs. All these different other contexts where you're using the same class name to do different things. Um, and then you're like, well, OK, maybe I could hope that everybody did BTN space large instead of maybe large space button, or they did button space other class space large. You run into these situations where you have to create these weird regex expressions to try to find every single instance of what you're looking for. It's also, uh, how many people here use the CSS preprocessor, SAS or less? Oh, good crowd. So you guys know about nesting, right, where you can nest selectors inside of other selectors. And then you kind of get into these weird things where, you know, this thing you're looking at, this dot large class, is actually nested inside of a button selector, but that's like a page up. And you can imagine, like, doing uh, maybe a git commit, and you're looking at the pull request, and you see dot large, and you see, like, a couple lines before and a couple lines after. You're like, what does this mean, dot large? I don't understand the context. So you have to click through on the file, and you have to drill in. And it's just a lot more work to understand how these things relate. And this is why the prefix really matters. It helps clarify our context, uh, clarify our intent in different contexts, whether it's in the CSS, whether it's in the HTML, whether it's in uh, you know, a pull request, all these different context, contexts. Um, it just makes it a lot clearer for everybody working on a project. Now with states, you know, when we're applying JavaScript on and off, um, and, and for me, like I try to avoid ever applying inline CSS with JavaScript. I know it, like as a JavaScript developer, it might seem really quick and easy just to do, you know, if you're using jQuery.css, the moment you see that, you double think. Because anytime you need to update that, you need to go back to the JavaScript. You know, keeping everything together in one place uh, makes things a lot easier. So your JavaScript should only have to come in and just apply a class and remove a class. So for example, if I want to hide something or show something from the page, I will actually avoid using the hide and show classes or the hide and show methods of jQuery and instead just do add class or remove class for hide and show and let my CSS take care of that. 
And what that means is that I have a lot more flexibility. I might want to look at maybe adding CSS animation so that when I go to show something on the page, it fades in. Right? I can do these neat transitions and things like that that CSS are giving us the power to do now um, by using uh, just applying classes as opposed to trying to use JavaScript to um, handle all that for me. And then theming, you know, using a theme prefix or for text, might having a text prefix. So from a naming convention perspective, um, there are essentially three things, right? We've got our modules, submodules, and subcomponents. And uh, within Smax, when I wrote it, it was like, okay, module names don't have any hyphenation, and that, to me, I can instantly know that's a root node. Now, if I'm looking at my HTML and I see a module name, and right beside it is a module name hyphen something else, I know that's a submodule. But again, no hyphens in the actual submodule name. The hyphen separates and, and allows me to identify a submodule from a module. And then for subcomponents, so if I see uh, an HTML element that doesn't have uh, a class name, uh, with a hyphen in it, uh, or without a hyphen in it, then I, I recognize, okay, this is a subcomponent. Now, there are other naming conventions in there. My understanding is, is that the naming convention that um, a lot of the stuff that work is being done on Drupal 8 is taking this kind of approach, which uh, is very similar to BEM, which stands for Block Element Modifier, which is another approach very similar to this. Again, this idea of modularizing um, our approach to CSS and HTML. And in this case, yeah, you know what, they allow for hyphens in, in root nodes. So to separate modules from sub-modules, they use double hyphens, and subcomponents use underscores. To me, this is a lot of visual noise. Um, I, I've seen another technique recently that I kind of like as well, uh, in which case it uses a single hyphen, a double hyphen, and then um, for multiple words, it just uses uh, camel case. Um, but the point is, is that, you know, when it comes to naming convention, the idea is to pick a system that works for you and your team and to be consistent. Um, and consider the fact that you do have these three different kinds of nodes uh, in your page. You know that you've got this root node, um, you know, we have these submodules and we have these subcomponents. So whatever naming convention you decide to use, um, pick something, be consistent, um, and hopefully you and the rest of your team will be very, very happy. Okay, so I've covered two things so far. Um, Categorization, name the convention. Last one, decoupling CSS from HTML. So, like I said, I, I know this concept kind of sounds really weird because CSS is designed to style HTML. Um, so I'm going to use this really quick example. Um, I think you guys can already imagine what the HTML for this looks like. We've got uh, a nav, we've got a nav li, and we've got a nav lia, right? This is a horizontal nav for a really simple um, navigation. Perfect. Of course, the client comes back and says, you know what, um, I really don't like the fact that the customers have to click on products to get to a list of stuff. Can, can I have it so when they move their mouse over, we get this little drop down that appears? Okay, no problem. We're going to just add this list inside. Great. And we end up with, um, well, you know what, those list items inside list items need to look a little bit different. So I start adding other selectors to get what I want. And the thing is, is that we have to start writing more CSS to override the CSS that we wrote before. Um, you know, list items by default don't have any float. We floated them, but now I have to remove the float. You know, any of the padding or background colors that I had on the regular nav, I now have to remove those or overwrite those in order to get everything working on the links um, inside the dropdown. Um, and a really quick fix for this is to use child selectors. How many of you have still have to worry about IE6? Oh, this, oh, th those are slow hands, sad hands having to put on. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, for the rest of you, child selectors are awesome. Um, and the reason for that is because it limits the scope, right? We're, we're now decoupling where before this, this nav li was applying to everything deep within it. By using this child selector, we're just saying, you know what, just apply it to this one particular thing. So now we're no longer impacting all these other elements. And this is what, this is what I mean by decoupling HTML from CSS. And the thing is, is that now these styles aren't affecting this drop-down menu, and I can style that drop-down menu as its own thing. So I'm going to apply a class to it to identify that this is a different visual element. You know, we've, uh, this horizontal nav is completely different from this drop-down. Um, you know, yeah, they're both navigation as a 
construct, but from a visual perspective, they are completely different, and we want to style those different. Um, so giving it its own class and then using the child selector to limit the impact so that if I wanted to put another menu that had a different visual style than this one, I could do that. And I could know that when I do that, when I put this module inside a module, it's not going to be impacted by the styles that I've created here. So use child selectors. Okay, one other quick example um, of what I mean here. So we've got this box. Um, and in this box, um, you know, I've got a list of sites that I like. And I think, you know, I've only got this one box, this HTML, very simple. I've got a heading and I've got an unordered list. So I'm just going to be really simple with this. I'm going to do dot box h2 dot box ul. Simple. Of course, the client comes back and says, wow, that one box looks fantastic. And I get some more boxes. So we're going to have this about us that talks about what the company is. And you know what? We actually have a sponsor. Um, so if we can get like a little sponsor uh, image to go in there as well. And what you can start to see is that the HTML structure here inside this is getting a little bit more unpredictable. Um, so we can we can do the quick fix and just start adding more selectors here. You know, okay, dot box p we're going to do this. Dot box div we're going to do this, and we're going to get closer to what we want. So in this unpredictable scenario here, where we don't know really what the HTML could be, we want to make it more dependable by creating a class and applying that. So that dot box body. So again, the dot box with the hyphen in front of it. This is indicating that it is related to dot box. So this, they're all part of the same module. Um, and we have this, this subcomponent that we're going to style in a certain way. And then we can apply that class to those other elements. So it's about applying a class when the HTML can or won't be predictable. So now I'm just going to go back to this here to explain another way that we could possibly solve this. Again, if the HTML can't be predictable, let's make it predictable. And so, and the way I would probably end up solving this is actually adding a div and surrounding each of these pieces of content with a div. So then my HTML becomes very predictable where I have, okay, I've got a div on the outside and then I've got a heading and then I've got a body. And that body is always going to be consistent. The content in there, I don't care about. It can be something completely unrelated, but that I have this predictability. So when we have predictability, we can rely on element selectors with our uh, module selectors, or um, if it won't be predictable, that we want to apply classes um, to, to give us that predictability. Okay, so what does this all mean? It's the idea of shifting your thinking. Because um, I think traditionally, um, I, I, I've seen this in a lot of places, um, and certainly the way I used to approach things was this idea of coding CSS with a page. Um, you know, you can imagine a site that had like an inside theme, or a, an inside template, and a home template. It was a very common pattern. Tons of sites have them. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of sites have them. And the thing is, is that we, we need to shift our thinking so that we're thinking more about a system uh, for our sites. There's actually a really great article um, that came out recently from uh, Dave Rupert called Responsive Deliverables. Um, definitely do a Google search for, uh, for that. And in it, he talks about um, Parabell's uh, had worked on a site for Microsoft and how um, they were really, okay, what are these components and, and these uh, parts of the page that we need to, to use in different contexts? Because once we start looking at responsive web design, then you can start to understand that in different contexts, we need to take something on the page and represent it in a different way. And this is something that I refer to as state-based design in the sense that you have all these different components on your page and you need to represent them in different ways. So for example, you might have a layout or module style. So this is like, okay, one particular state. Our sub-modules represent a second state. Uh, you know, we have these JavaScript-driven states or the state uh, categories that I had described before where, you know, we want to add this JavaScript on and off. We have pseudo-class states, things like hover, active, focus, HTML5, um, there's a CSS3 module uh, called the UI module that adds a bunch of other selectors like uh, in range and out of range. So if you're using a number field with max and min, then you can actually use CSS to style that. Um, and, and we have all these other classes that are now coming in that allow us to handle some interactivity completely at the CSS level. 
And then we've also got media query states. The moment you know a browser is resized to a specific width, or maybe we're looking at it on a phone or on a tablet, in these particular states, how do we represent the things on our page? What does our layout look like? What does a particular module look like? Now, I love this. Uh, this thing called CSS Panic. Um, this is pretty incredible. So we've got uh, these little alligators that you click on, and when you click on them, this little counter goes up, little timer at the bottom. The thing that really impresses me about this is that this is done completely with CSS. There is not one line of JavaScript for that. Now, if you dig into the code for this, um, there's uh, these enemies, right? So we have this object on our page, this module, um, that represent these enemies. Now, the interesting thing here is, is that uh, if you kind of notice this like, appearance uh, property, they've changed it to a button. And the reason for that is because those alligators are actually checkboxes. Now, checkboxes are notoriously difficult to style. And so they use uh, a lovely browser feature to allow them to style them as if they were buttons, which give you a lot more control and allow them to style them to look like alligators. And then with that, they were able to adjust, like for example, pointer events so that when you try to click on it, it doesn't respond to mouse events. Um, all the animations are removed, the opacity is removed, so it disappears from the canvas. The moment you click on that checkbox, it disappears from the page. And this is what I feel like is, as an industry is something that we're moving towards. This idea of being able to represent things in different states. So this alligator is default state is moving in and out, using CSS animation to move in and out. And I mean, like when CSS animations first came on to the scene, I actually wrote a blog post and I'm like, no, this does not belong with CSS. This is JavaScript, this is behavior. But again, this, this mental shift of thinking of things as states, you realize, okay, well, you know what? Yeah, this, this kind of makes sense. If you can have a modal dialogue, and if you can imagine this like throb effect on the button, um, like older versions of OS X had, um, you know, that, or you know, the moment we, we have this dialogue, what does it look like uh, when we shift between states? And realizing that CSS is actually a great way to describe these things. And as a result of that, it's okay, you know what? Yeah, CSS animations can make a lot of sense. So, you know, if we have an alligator on our page, and you know, who doesn't these days, that we can say, okay, well, that alligator by default should look like this, and then when we change its state, it should do something else. You know, with the navigation, the moment we move our mouse over, what does that look like in a different state? When we resize our page, what does it look like in a different state? Okay, so I've talked about three things, categorization, naming convention, and decoupling HTML from CSS. Thank you very much. Now, we do have some time for questions. Uh, so there is a stand right in the middle. If you do have any questions, feel free to line up. And uh, I think we've got one person all set to go. Thank you. This is, this is really fantastic. Um, one thing that you didn't cover, and I wonder if maybe you didn't cover because, as I suspect, it's not that important. Um, I used to spend a lot of time sort of obsessing over, like, categorizing, like, where to put things in my CSS file. And as I started to just get really, like, embrace the sort of Firebug web developer uh, workflow, I just, it no longer mattered. Um, would you agree with that, or do you have any tips of um, situations where it kind of does matter and what to do? So uh, in this case, uh, yeah, there's, there's a whole thing about, like, file organization and, like, how you structure your files. Um, I, I probably could have stu stood up here for another hour and, and talked about that. In, in that particular case, um, some of it is minimized. You know, the, when you start isolating styles so they really stand alone, yeah, you can have them all in one big file. And as long as you know where each section is, where each module is, you can find what you're looking for. Um, however, I think that, you know, when we start looking at preprocessors and we start looking at, you know, how do we bundle things up, the, the ability to isolate things away into their own files um, give us a lot of control. So we could say, here's a file for this module, here's a file for that module, here's a file for this set of C uh, layouts, here's our base style. And so you end up with 40, 50 different CSS files um, that really construct the visual design of your project. So, you know, here are the components, um, here are the different visual patterns, and here are the CSS components for that. And when I talked about isolation um, early in, in the presentation, 
this ability to isolate things says to me, okay, what does a button look like? I can take just the button HTML, just the button CSS, load it up by itself and go, that's what I wanted. And if I need to make any changes, then I can take a look at just my buttons and know exactly how that's going to render. Instead of having to load up a page, you know, okay, I changed my modal CSS, I have to click on every single modal dialog and make sure nothing broke. That's not something that I want to do. I want to be able to just isolate those files and be able to test that. Um, so from a file perspective, yeah, a lot of the naming convention does minimize that, um, but breaking things out, um, I think, also gives us a lot of benefits um, as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, so a couple of questions. Well, first of all, thank you for even writing this. It kind of it made it possible for us from a front-end development point to actually make uh, back-end developers understand the complexity of CSS. It's not you making CSS. Oh, you're making the bottom green. Thank you. Um, no, so, so the thing is we're trying to move um, all, a lot of these principles into Drupal 8 and to Drupal Core. And one of the issues Drupal Core uh, came into was modules that naming things. So I'm wondering how much we're going to have to bribe you to get it to be called component success. Uh, I, I can be bought. Yeah. That was what I thought. I mean, this, I guess it's just a part of a bar and beers and a committee. I, I need to create a new book, the, the Drupal edition, and just uh, like a rename to all the... Um, yeah, that was actually just... It, it's kind of the issues we're going to have now that we have modules and smacks modules and we're going to have blocks and we're going to have trick blocks and we're, oh god damn it, can the world just understand our problems and align? We are big enough for that now, right? I mean, we're 3,300 people. <laughs> so, well, thanks, Roy. Thank you. So, one of the things that I've really been enjoying about SAS is that I can have a lot leaner markup. I don't have to, you know, I, I can just include and extend a lot of classes in my CSS. Um, a lot of what Smacks does is it seems like it's, you know, being extremely, you know, kind of prolific with its classes in order to make sure that everything will be consistent and targetable and reusable. So when you're using, like, I think, you know, I can see this and say, okay, like, writing CSS Smacks makes a little sense, but when you're writing SAS, do you really use a lot of heavy including and extending, or do you just try to keep it more yeah, so when it comes to uh, preprocessors, um, I, I use things very judiciously. Um, I don't uh, do a lot of extend. Specifically, I don't extend across modules. So I will extend within a given module. Um, so that may allow me to minimize the amount of classes that I apply to a particular element. So, you know, with the example where I have a module um, and a submodule class on the same thing, then um, I can compact that into a single class. Um, with that said, there are caveats to that. So it, there are situations um, I, I tend to avoid that. So w I, I'm trying to choose my words very carefully. When it comes to a lot of uh, preprocessors, the thing that I'm worried about is not only the HTML size, but also the CSS size. And a lot of the extending um, that I've seen people do end up with really large files. Um, especially if you have complex modules with a lot of subcomponents, um, the moment you go to extend that, it starts to balloon your CSS file really quickly. And I feel that by applying these classes to the HTML, um, that it is still possible to do it judiciously. Like I don't, I will not have an HTML element on my page where I've got like six classes. Um, I keep it to usually two, on occasion three. Um, the moment I've gone beyond that, I need to rethink how I do things. Um, and that is an approach that has worked well for me. So I use SAS. Uh, we use SAS uh, at Shopify. I like it. The mix-ins, um, there's a lot of the mix-ins that are fantastic. But a lot of the stuff with extend um, is not something. Now, placeholder is something that I think is more in line. So if you do have something that you find you, you need to reuse in a lot of places that you want to sort of codify as this object, I will tend to use placeholder. Um, it still results in some duplication. Um, and again, when you start seeing too much duplication, then the question is, is, am I looking at a visual pattern that is the same and that I can really should be codifying as its own object? Um, and I think a lot of this argument actually comes out of this debate of semantics. Um, so a lot of people, instead of having a module that is like, here is my list view, will say, no, this isn't a list view. This is a list of products. So we call this products. 
call this one events, call this customers, and use extend to say my products look like, my events look like, you know, all these different things. And all that does is it says your CSS is not just dot products, it's dot products, comma, dot events, comma, and then you end up with these long selectors. And this really, to me, harder to maintain code, you know, going to uh, the CSS inspector, going to examine something, and suddenly you just see this block of selectors, and you have to think, oh, okay, that's, I guess, what I want. Um, and that, for me, is harder to maintain, whereas if I can stick to just one or two class names, it's a lot easier to look and say, okay, this visual pattern is a list view, and then I'm just going to reuse that list view class in all these different contexts, as opposed to worrying too much about what the actual content is. I come from SUNY GNCO. I have a question about the responsible site. We are working on this project for our website. Um, my question is, do we need to rewrite all the CSS code? No. <laughs> <laughs> Good. It's yeah, good. I mean, when it comes to responsive web design, again, we're, we're talking about, okay, what is changing in different contexts? Um, and the context shouldn't be phone or tablet, it's when does the design break? So in other words, you may have this three column layout that when we move down to a particular size, the content just doesn't fit in there anymore. Um, and so you may think, okay, the modules that are existing in here, do I need to change those or do I need to change the layout? And then you should be saying, okay, in this particular context, now I want to change to a two column layout, now I want to change to a one column layout. So all we're doing is we're creating uh, these styles that are affecting just the layout in just these one, these one or two different cases. It may be a case where, you know what, maybe it is the module that needs to change, that once it gets to a certain size, that instead of having image to the left, text to the right, that we now stack image on top, text to the bottom, in order to get everything to still work within, you know, the three column layout that we have on a tablet. And so once we start looking at, you know, how do we, how does our page work? Um, and from a design perspective, what happens when we do that? Now, admittedly, CSS right now is still limited in the sense that what you care about that module is like, how much width does that actual module have in the context of the layout? And responsive web design right now is still all about the page. What does that module look like at the entire page? And that's still difficult for us to uh, solve. Um, so we always have to say, okay, this module, when I resize, I'm gonna change, um, the width of this, or I'm going to do something different with it in this particular context. But where this breaks is that if I say, I'm going to go and actually change my layout now, it's going to affect all these modules. And therefore, when I resize down, I now need to go back to uh, change my modules because I changed the layout in this particular context. So that is still a problem with CSS that just CSS as a spec hasn't solved for us yet. And hopefully in two to four years, it'll be solved. Thank you. Hi, going off his previous question, um, how do you handle elements, especially when using preprocessors, um, helper classes like clear fix and ABC placement? Do you extend, do you include, put them in the HTML? So for image uh, replacement, um, so in the case of a preprocessor, I, I uh, tend to have a helper CSS file, um, and there's not a ton of stuff that I put in there. So when it comes to image replacement, um, I'm almost always now, um, I have an icon module, um, and the, so in the book actually, I have a chapter on the icon module, and I, I feel like it's a really useful pattern. Um, I learned it from a coworker um, at Yahoo, and I was like, this is brilliant, um, because it made things a lot easier. And the, so that to me, image replacement is a module. Clear fix is something that I'm going to apply. Now with that, when it comes to float containment, like so, why am I using a clear fix? I'm almost always using a clear fix because of float containment, because I want like a background image to appear. Um, so first, do I even need to use one? In a lot of cases, I don't. Um, just having like the next module underneath it, maybe I just say clear float, like uh, clear both, and boom, I've solved my problem. Or um, I'll actually use um, position, um, sorry, not position, um, overflow hidden um, as my float containment. So on this particular module, because I know I need to float, uh, contain floats, I'm just going to apply overflow hidden in that particular module as opposed to applying a clear fix. Um, so again, it's like I'm thinking about this module. How does that module behave? Applying the uh, classes and styles that I need um, using like the actual clear fix um, where you've got like the after 
you're adding a dot in there and you're trying to hide that dot. Those types of things are things I try to avoid and very rarely do I actually need on a particular project. So when I do need it, I'm just going to apply that clear fix in that one particular case. Um, but with a lot of the projects that I've worked on, those helper classes, I've tended to not have very many. Okay, thank you. If anybody else wants to step up, I'll go again. Um, so to kind of riff again on the kind of the leanness of either the CSS or the markup, like for a grid system, um, you know, I'd rather have like section, it's like a class of main content and then a side, just sidebar first, and then include, you know, grid call nine on the content, grid call three on the sidebar. I wouldn't want to have classes in there to specify that. And so I think that's one of the main advantages of SAS is you can actually have semantic markup in a grid system. You're not locking yourself outside of that kind of CSS and garden ideal. So, you know, if a lot of things like, you know, button large, button search, button go, I think those can be explicit cases where it makes sense to mark that out, but there's other times where, let's say, add a breakpoint or a state change, you know, that class might not always be descriptive. So, I mean, would you still be like, like grid nine column and then like, you know, is mobile, then like three column to overwrite that? Or would you yeah, just be I, like, yeah, I actually avoid that. I, I avoid naming conventions that, anytime I name, naming things are hard, right? There's, there's a common joke. There's two hard things in uh, computer science. Um, off by one error is a naming convention. Yeah. Uh, naming things for us. We're at the gym. Yeah, it really sucks. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. Um, n naming things are hard, right? Because we, we, we often um, will gravitate towards a particular naming convention. And uh, when it comes to things like responsive web design, where I'm not going to apply a class that says dot tablet so that I can actually use that in my uh, media queries in order to style that. I, I avoid that. Um, I will, um, I avoid saying this is a nine column layout. I'm gonna say this is a grid layout. Um, and I'm, I tend to keep, with a lot of the design work that I do, I keep my uh, grid system very simple. Uh, in other words, I don't have a 12 column grid. I've got a three column grid or I've got like a four column grid and that's pretty much the extent of it. Um, I'm not gonna say, well, on this particular page, I'm gonna have two columns on this, Particular thing, I'm gonna have three, then I'm gonna have four, and then I'm gonna have eight, um, and I'm just gonna like mix all over the place. Um, I tend to keep my layouts pretty simple, but that's just that's my design approach. Um, but with that, yeah, the, the naming convention that I'm gonna use, um, I'm gonna try to name things in such a way that I know that that class is still applicable in all the different contexts that it exists in, and and that's the thing with a lot of the other naming convention um, that I talk about, uh, and it's interesting because. I still run into this problem. I still fail at this when it comes to naming things. Uh, on the Smacks website, um, when I first put together the workshops page, um, I had this area um, where each of the locations um, that I was having, I wanted this blue highlight. So I'm like, okay, these are location modules. So this is the style that I want to use. And then when I created the store, I'm like, you know what? I, I'd like to highlight these things, and I, I want it's going to look exactly like these locations. And so I added a location class to my products, and I went, ooh, that's not good. Uh, but as a lazy developer, that's what I did. Um, and so what I should have done is really thought about what was what was the design goal that this thing was serving. It, it, yes, it was a location, but the design, the purpose of it was to highlight something on the page. Calling it highlight would have made a heck of a lot more sense. And if I want to highlight a product or highlight a location, it would have worked perfectly in both of those contexts. And that's where naming convention, um, and it's something that is a const constant thing that as a team, you have to work on to make sure that everything is consistent and makes sense and that you know that in all the different contexts, um, it's going to make a lot of sense. And on that, thank you very much. Thanks for sticking around.